So thank you very much again. Uh, before we start to have few questions, may I ask one question? I mean, you talked about engagement, but again, what can I do if I want to foster my right to get information? What can I personally do as an individual and what can I do as a journalist? Just one very short round on this topic. Um, maybe Joe, you start, or Helen starts, yeah. <laughs> Well, try to keep it short because there's so much that you can do and I think that people in the room can benefit from the experience of civil society campaigns all around, um, uh, all around Europe. I think one thing that you can do as journalists, perhaps, is write about when you're getting and when you're not getting information and refer to the law. That's something that's been done very successfully in the UK where if you open a, a newspaper in the UK, I actually did this experiment once at random. I bought the independent newspaper when I went back on a visit to the UK. And on the first five out of, in the first five out of six stories, they mentioned, according to documents obtained under the Freedom of Information Act, which is a fantastic way of reinforcing in the public's mind that the right exists. You might be doing the opposite. You might be saying, we tried to obtain it, we were denied it, and therefore the Information Act needs to be changed. Um, but you really can uh, use your stories, um, or you can say, I requested it under our substandard access to information law, and it was denied to me yet again. And that way you get the message to support the campaign which is being done, which I hope will eventually result in a new law. So write about it. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Well, well just a quick answer. Um, not only write about it, um, but ask politicians why you are not allowed to know this information. Just let them argue why the public is not allowed to know something. That's very funny. <laughs> <laughs> and always a story. Yeah, that's a story in itself. <laughs> Yeah, yep. I would, would basically agree with you, saying um, you have to demonstrate the public value of, mm -hmm. of, of being able to get this data. And um, I, I think... I've lost my thread now. Okay. Imagine if I did that. Imagine if I did Yeah, but that's something... Okay. Hmm? All right. Um, well, um, as you heard, uh, I'm, today is my last day working for the city of Vienna, so I'm leaving. Perhaps I can speak... Uh, also some more open words, frankly, my own opinion. I would say it's, it could be important for journalists to resist uh, deal-making. Uh, so in order to get information exclusively, um, perhaps uh, give an answer back, perhaps uh, it would be better to publish data for not just for one organization, but for all the organizations. Or if you receive data exclusively, um, at least publish data as a whole on your own website. Uh, and not just make some scoops for uh, one or two uh, print articles. You write and you have a lot of, a ton of data available where nobody else can see and use that data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, please. I, I actually, I had on my computer, but the projector's off now. Um, a fantastic example from Ireland. Um, it's thestory.ie, a journalist called uh, Gavin Sheridan. And what he does is exactly what you suggested, Thomas. He, Gets, he files requests for information, gets the data, uses it to write his story, and then puts everything else up online so that other people can access it. And that is a great way of kind of building a community of journalists to promote the right of access to information. Okay, thank you. Now please, questions from the audience. Or remarks or experiences. Anybody? No? Yeah, please. I know that they don't have the political capacity to answer in the name of the city of Vienna, but do you believe it will take a tw 10 or 20 years that the city of Vienna will launch a Freedom of Information Act? And secondly, we all know what are the secret documents and political sensitive studies here in the city of Vienna. Uh, any attempts to release them? Well, it's really hard for me to answer that question. Um, what I can give you is the true con um, conviction that there is a real spirit of openness inside the city of Vienna, and so it's also regarding uh, political uh, area. So I really think that uh, we will see in the coming years more data that will be released uh, from the si inside the city of Vienna. Also due to that really, really positive uh, feedback in the, uh, we had on this um, 
open data portal. It's a real success story for the administration and is uh, seen as a highly valuable effort inside the whole of the administration, though this will really uh, continue in the next years. And so I think it will also include more sensitive or sensible um, data, not, not regarding personal data, but data that uh, is interesting for critical um, data. I really think so. I can't answer it more uh, in, in depth uh, because I don't know. And, and just briefly to Helen, how many European countries still lack a Freedom of Information Act? And what would you propose for those countries who still don't have this kind of legislation uh, as an interim uh, strategy? I mean, we can't rely on Act, okay? I mean, the journalists are fed up to fight for, for, these, uh, for these kind of data, okay? I mean, uh, do you have any good lessons for the interim phase? Mm -hmm. Thanks, yeah. Um, well, in the European Union region, uh, the countries which do not have any kind of law right now, um, let's assume that Austria kind of does, but doesn't really, um, are Luxembourg, Cyprus, two countries being famous for being open and transparent, um, <laughs> and S Spain. And one of the reasons that the organization I work with is based in Spain is because we took a strategic decision to fight for an access to information law in Spain. We haven't yet achieved it. Um, we've got a draft that we're discussing with the government right now and I was actually in the OSCE yesterday because, here in Vienna because they've criticized the government's draft. Um, but th that's, been, that's, that's a campaign which perhaps we, you know, that's the kind of experience that we can share with you here in Austria, how in a Western European country to get um, people mobilized, including journalists. And we've been, I mean, we couldn't have done the campaign without fantastic support from the journalists who do exactly that. You know, they ask in press conferences, where's the law? When are we going to get it? Um, and they write about it. Um, so uh, that, that, that's the situation which we hope is going to change. But there are very few countries. You know, every single ex-communist country which entered the EU on the 1st of May 2004 had a functioning, I mean functioning, better or worse, but functioning freedom of information law. Uh, they're amongst those 90 countries in the world. Um, so so I, I do think, I don't know whether it would be the city of Vienna that would do it. I would think that your campaign really should be targeted at the national level because you do have to address this issue of your Constitutional Secrecy Act. I have to say it's not easy in a country that's resistant to change. And in Spain, we've been using every tool in the book, the campaigning, bringing the international pressure on Spain, and taking legal cases. And we got the sentence in the Spanish Supreme Court for our first, the first sentence uh, last week. And we lost. So the Spanish Supreme Court said last week, in spite of all that international jurisprudence which I've just thrown at you, um, and I hope some more people in the room now are, are somewhat convinced that perhaps this is a right, but the Spanish Supreme Court certainly is not convinced that it's a right, and they've said no, we are, and it's just very briefly, it's an amazing case, because we asked, what has Spain done to implement the UN Convention Against Corruption? And they said, citizens do not have the right to ask questions of the government. They, they saw that that was a, a sort of abstract philosophical question rather than we wanted hard facts. Um, so, you know, there are countries where it's still a battle um, and I'm trying to paint a positive picture, but in that sense you're not alone and many people are fighting to defend this right in other countries as well. Can I just add, I think, I think we also need to get more aggressive in the kind of demands we have. Um, because there's kind of this huge disparity between what is, what is kind of a standard of transparency in, in, in Anglo-Saxon countries and what's happening here in kind of the German space. And it's just, it's just ages away from each other. And I, I think we should just say this is what, what the rest of the world is doing now and, and, and why is it, is it not happening here. So for example, one thing that for example we did as a mistake in Germany was we, we, we had a lot of arguments about, around budgets. And, and around the fact that budgets should be, should be released, this is what Helen hinted at before. And there's just no sane argument against it. And in the rest of the world, the discussion is should much more granular information, should information that relates to particular contracts, to the conditions of these contracts, should that stuff be public? Um, the same thing in, in Germany, we have these debates, and I think this is the same thing that's happening in, in Austria at the moment, about transparency of parties, and uh, in particular of... of, of, of um, side incomes of parliamentarians. And there's, there's just um, 
there's just a very simple answer to that, which is it should be stated in full and in full detail, and naming naming the the, the donor, and um, we just shouldn't shouldn't go into into all of these these bad compromises anymore, just because it's it's kind of the tradition here in Germany. I think we should kind of start to pick up with the rest of the world seriously. Sorry. Yeah, please. Uh, Goras Zukovic, Slovenian press agency. Um, just a question, you, the countries you listed, Cyprus, Austria, obviously, among the worst in terms of FOI. Um, what's the correlation between banking secrecy and, <laughs> and lack of freedom of information? And, you know, how does that work? Well, I think uh, in those two particular <laughs> examples, there's definitely a correlation. And I mean, something, you know, somebody mentioned open corporates. I don't know, who was it you, uh, Friedrich? Well, well. I mean, Switzerland. Switzerland, but Switzerland does have a Freedom of Information Act. It's not being very used, and it's not being very much used by journalists, although I hear that that's beginning to change now. Um, but it's true, there are some countries which have even made, you know, a sort of a commercial interest out of uh, a culture of secrecy. Um, I think what, what's for me is very interesting is if you look at the countries which are asking the EU to bail them out right now, um, they're, they're countries, uh, Portugal, Spain, Italy, Greece, Cyprus, and I would say in the European region, they're the, the least transparent countries. Austria, you're doing quite well, so it doesn't quite fit into the pattern, but... Oh. You're not being bailed out right now, I believe. Um, uh, but there, there, there are clear correlations, and I think that's the kind of leverage that we should be using. Um, there are clear correlations between secrecy and serious problems in the, in the economy, between high levels of corruption, um, and, and that's, that's, I completely agree with you, the, the sort of slightly more aggressive stance. One thing that we've done in in Spain, which you might look at doing in Austria as well, and which you have in Germany, admittedly you have a law in Germany, is the what, what's called Fragdenstaat in, in Germany, um, which is called in Spanish for Spanish speakers, tu derecho a saber, and we have it at the EU level, Ask the EU, which is a website where people can file requests for information. And what's nice about that, and maybe you can talk to the German experience, but what's happened in the UK at the EU level, it's happening now in Spain, is that what we're doing is we're making transparent the level of failure to answer people's requests. Because it's done by a website where you ask a question and it just shows not answered yet, not answered yet, not answered yet, or refused. Um, so you can use those visual tools, which some of you in the room are very good at designing and developing, to, to advance the campaign on the right of access to information. Let me just add something. If I got it right, we talked about the banking banking system. Was that true? I mentioned banking. Well, yeah. it, was, it was banking yeah. secrecy versus um, secrecy in general. I think it's just, um, I tried to just figure out what, what kind of deal Austria made with Switzerland recently. Um, if, if I got it right, and, and please don't quote me on that because it's not, uh, I, I didn't recheck it yet, uh, but if I got it right, we actually sold our right to know to Switzerland. Um, we actually get, we get money from Switzerland um, because a lot of Austrians probably have some money in Switzerland and the Austrian authorities are not allowed to know who's going to have that money in Switzerland and how much and where and so on. And they sold the right to know for the future if I got it right. But um, I think there's a lot of journalists in, in the room. Um, uh, it's easy to check that. Um, but I haven't read a story about that. And it's not, it's not so much on, on the personal uh, right to have your uh, bank account secret, uh, but on the government's right to um, uh, find people who um, <coughs> give black money to other countries. Okay. Thank you. Hello, I'm uh, Joseph Dreyer, um, uh, information designer here from Vienna, and I would go even go a little bit further um, we're always talking about open government data, but uh, nowadays we have some industries who have uh, even greater data, bigger, more, much more bigger data warehouses, and um, which are even somehow power, more powerful than some states, like about uh, uh, Google or uh, Microsoft or you know all. 
Um, shouldn't we uh, expand uh, our demand to open data to uh, some uh, special uh, corporations, uh, some special uh, firms, which uh, are, uh, have an implication on all our lives? Very good question. Who is going to answer first, Friedrich? Yeah. Friedrich, I decide. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, um, I wouldn't agree with the examples you named, but I agree with the sentiment. I mean, Google and Facebook, they have APIs for all the stuff that should be public and the rest shouldn't be public, so um, it's a problem of oversharing as it is. Um, but there's, there's really interesting industries to, to look at, and um, I would just want to name two that are kind of very, very different. Um, one is just pub public transport companies, because all of these things are, are privatized, and... Um, just getting getting transport information is crucial to making making good good applications around that. Um, so that's it would, would just be useful for them. And for example, in France, the SNCF has just basically created a data portal to release this information um, and 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 start to kind of share share their stuff. Um, a very different kind of issue is extractive industries. And probably Helen, you're much much more up to date with the current state. But um, basically, the European Union is right now debating. Um, what, what kind of reporting requirements there should be on European companies in terms of reporting um, what, what extractive activities they have here and abroad. And I think that's, that's really important to know because it's kind of the trigger for quite a lot of interesting <laughs> developments. Mm -hmm. Maybe you want to... Yeah, no, absolutely. There is a lot of work and thinking going on it, on it right now. We've, we've made some gains. So um, if you look at the definition in many national access to information laws and in the Council of Europe Convention, it talks about private companies exercising administrative authority or private companies performing public functions, operating with public funds. Um, so so that, that's some kind of an achievement, but it's, it's not going as far as you're going in terms of the, the huge impact of, of companies at a global level. Um, there, there is work being done, and it's coming out of the corporate social responsibility community, looking at the exactly the, the non-financial reporting obligations of companies based inside the EU at least, which would be to do with their involvement in the extractive industries. It could be environmental impacts that they're having in countries outside the EU. It could be data about their employment practices in countries outside the EU. So we're starting to get that. Um, but what we haven't achieved as a movement in, in terms of fighting for the right of access to information, perhaps because we've been so busy trying to get the right of access to government information realized as a starting point, is we haven't really achieved clarity on what kind of information we might have a right to from private companies. The one country in the world, and unfortunately it is only one country, which has that very clear is South Africa. And South Africa put in its post-apartheid constitution that when a private company holds information which is needed for defending a fundamental right, you have a right to request and get that information. And that's been used for people campaigning for land rights, um, on water issues, and so forth. So there, there, there are things that have been done, but we've still got quite a long way to go. And as a as fairly sort of small and overstretched community of civil society people, we're, we're trying to work on that. But I would say in the next... Um, who knows how long it will. It's very hard to predict these things, but in the next 10 years at least, I would hope we could make some significant impact on that. And particularly, that's what I love about the decision from the European Court of Human Rights, because it introduces this new concept um, of information monopolies. And that's equally valid for a government as it is for a private organization. So if we could perhaps in the future somehow extend that and say, you know, when I'm trying to exercise my right to freedom of expression and the only source of the information that I need to do so is a private company, then I have some right to that information. That could be, that could be very interesting, but we're not there yet. Thomas, wasn't there talk on open business data recently from your, from your network? No. Uh, yes, there was. Yes, there was. <laughs> can you say something about the, the, the status quo? It, it wasn't me talking there, but uh, ah, okay. uh, was presented. Um, well. I'm, I can't say anything. Okay. <laughs> but I mean, it, uh, in my impression, the discussion will pop up, but there is not a lot of discussion on this topic now. Yeah. Joe, you wanted to add something? No. Next question. 
Okay, then it's a question, uh, a very practically oriented question. Uh, how do I make an FOI request? Yeah, um, yeah. we really need to get the, uh, maybe in the coffee yeah. break, we can get us, the EU, up on the screen. It's really very easy. And I think that's, that's the other thing for people who've never done it before. And you can read about, we've got model examples in the Legal Leaks Toolkit, and that's available online. Um, if you go to the Ask the EU website, for example, if, if we have time quickly, I can, I can do yeah, this. Can. Um, it's gone to sleep. Um, you really, I mean, it, of course it depends where you are, but you basically need to, to say, you shouldn't, you shouldn't really need to cite the law, but even, nothing's happening, um, even if you decide that you're going to want to refer to the law, it should be basically something like, under the, Sorry. and I've got here, let's see if it's, this is ask the, uh, could you? Yeah, um, I Basically, what I would do if I'm writing an information request to the EU or in any country, I would, I would probably say, you know, under the Freedom of Information Act, year 2000, I am requesting the following information and just list it. Ah, uh, great. There's a slight trick at the EU level, that the EU rule is access to documents, not information. So you have to say, I request the following, following documents or documents which contain the following information. Um, okay. It was open. It no, that's uh, no, that's not. Perfect. Let's go back here. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, okay. Here we go. Great. Yeah. So this is the website. Ask the EU. It's in. It's going slowly. It's in four languages, so you could use it in in German if you want to. Um, do, what do you, Friedrich? Do you usually do your requests in English? On us? Yeah. yeah. Um, or even even. I mean, you you haven't used the German. Just while this is going on, I yeah. think there's also a few, few other things that we can go just for a recording. Yeah. <laughs> um, that are useful. Number one is, is it maybe may sound a bit, bit self, um, self evident, but really know what you're asking for. For example, if you can get, if you want to get a database, and um, that's what I, I usually want to get, then I kind of try to research a lot around what, what kind of, how does government store this information? I mean, and most of my requests fail because a part of the information I was requesting was not available. And so if I know very precisely how this information is being kept within the, uh, within, um, the, 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 um, within the government, then I can make a much better request and have a very specific quest, uh, question to um, um, what's going on. A second thing that's, I think, um, true for, for, for most of the European Union and may also, I don't know how, how successful you've used it here, is environmental um, access yeah. rights. So um, this, this affects not, at first we thought this affected only stuff that was within the environmental ministry, but it affects everything and it has some impact on the environment and you've got much better access rights there. Um, and yeah, so this is um, this is Fraktionsstaat. Just to say very quickly, it's um, the a German site we did. Um, we started it, and we now have I think about 30% of the German freedom of information requests going across this site. So we have a pretty good good record of how many of them were agreed to, how many of them were denied, and we've had we've had a lot of kind of um, media attention coming out of out of the different requests. So basically, I think um, lots of journalists now have this on their on their news feed and kind of see if interesting interesting answers come in. Um, one particularly interesting thing that happened, for example, was um, around the um, around um, uh, a study that was made in Parliament um, uh, regarding um, corruption of, of parliamentarians. And basically, the research service of the Parliament um, made made a study that said very clearly that that Germany was in violation of, of uh, EU convention and that um, basically um, parliamentary corruption in Germany. Uh, was not was not outlawed. Um, the parliament gave us this report, but they gave us this report with the condition that we, we couldn't share it because it was copyrighted. We then built a small button on this um, that would ba basically allow everyone to make the same request with, with just one <laughs> click. Um, we had 450 requests within a week. And I, th I think that's kind of a nice case of using technology to, to just get some leverage and get, uh, get, get the upper hand in a, in a kind of weird bureaucratic power play. But that's a very nice example. I didn't know about that example, but that's great. Yes, if enough, if they're going to be difficult about it, just get enough people 
to ask it. Um, for some reason, our EU website is not working. Um, <laughs> but Fraktinstadt is a wonderful place to surf around and get inspired. Um, and yeah, keep your request simple. I agree with you that you need to know what you're looking for. De and there are tips about that in the Legal Leaks Toolkit as well. Definitely don't get so excited. Oh, it's my first information request. I'm going to ask for every document between 1914 and today, you know. Um, but, but at the same time, there are certain strategies you can use. For example, if you're looking at a particular public procurement contract, which you've got an interest in because you think something funny was going on there, maybe you don't want to ask only for that public procurement contract. Maybe you want to ask for the public procurement contracts in the last month in that kind of area. So think a little bit strategically um, when, you, when you're digging into a story that's very specific um, to ask a request that's, that's going more likely to be answered but which is not going to completely give your game away as a journalist and possibly even trigger hiding of information or destruction of documents. So, th so there are various techniques in terms of how you formulate your request, which you, you might want to think about. But if you file a request in that way in Germany, they will charge you a huge amount of money. A minimum 1,000, 2,000, if you do it in that way. I mean, it's an intelligent way, but it's expensive in most countries. Well, no, it's not expensive in most countries. Because in most countries, they can only charge you for the copying and delivery costs. And if the information is delivered electronically, they can't charge you for that. I mean, you can tell us the latest situation, but there are, there are a handful of countries where you have to pay. Um, in Canada and Ireland, you have to pay for filing a request. And I, I mentioned, I think I've got it up here, I mentioned the, the, this Irish journalist who does the story. Um, maybe, yes, that's it. That's the website. The story with all he's put up all the spreadsheets he's got. That's great because he's paid 15 euros for every request and he's sharing all the information so other journalists can use it. But that's the exception, not the rule in Europe. And then you've got, there have been attempts to charge for search fees in the Netherlands, which um, has been an issue. And how's it working with Fragdenstadt? Are they charging you? Just to say, yeah, we've, we've been receiving the, the kind of threat of charging us quite a lot, but we haven't yet been, been actually charged very often. So we had, we had two cases where this was interesting. One is we discovered that the Chancery, basically whenever they answer requests, they have this template le letter that before they actually even process, is, uh, they say, this looks like a very complicated question. We are going to charge you 500 euros for it. <laughs> then you say, it's not very complicated, and then they answer. But you kind of do, need, need, to yeah. do that, need to do that loop with them. The other thing was um, we, we, we FOI the Justice Ministry for stuff uh, related to ACTA, um, the European Treaty there. And, um, or the international treaty, and um, they asked for 500 bucks to answer it, and we kind of just started raising stuff on a block and um, got 7,000 um, uh, euros within a weekend, and now we can not only pay for the request, but also sue them if they decide not to. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's, a, that's another thing that I would really would encourage Joseph and um, the people leading the campaign here in Austria to do. I would really, and, and all of you, think, think about not giving up at the first obstacle. Exactly. Think about your strategies for um, pushing to get an answer. At the EU level, at the European Commission level, um, when people file a first administrative appeal, it's, called, it's got a stupid name, it's called a confirmatory application, but it's just a, an appeal. So when they deny the information and you appeal, 75% of times the information is fully or partially released following the appeal. That's a fantastic return rate and it means that in 75% of cases they were just wrong to refuse it in the first place. So pushing that little bit harder can get you really significant results. Writing a story about the denial is another way of pushing, but use, use the legal mechanisms, and I would very much encourage you to take, you've got some cases going through the courts there, but to think of one or two more strategic cases. Another thing which is done, which I love, I'm going from here to, tonight to Bulgaria, um, and the Bulgarians develop something which has been copied around the world, which is they give up prizes every year on the 28th of September, is International Right to Know Day, so I hope to hear some 28th of September events taking place here in uh, Austria as well. And in Bulgaria, on the 28th of September, they give three awards. They give a golden key for the, the government body or the individual who's most, done most to advance the right of access to information. They give a golden padlock 
to the government body, which is the most secretive. And that's very nice because no one wants it, it gets a lot of media coverage, and no one wants that golden padlock. And then the one I like most, they give this twisted key for the most ridiculous answer to an ac access to information <laughs> request. Um, and, and, you know, have, yeah, have some fun with it as well, because there are some really silly answers out there. Um, and that's a, another way of trying to... And, and what it's all about at the end of the day, and this, this came up in the other panelists' discussions, and I made a note of it, it's all about a change in the bureaucratic culture. It's about a change in the way that public officials treat... Um, treat the citizens. And of course you've got, you've got people who are inside the administration who understand that and who are really keen to change it. So it's not, it's not that you haven't got allies inside government who would also like to see government being much more transparent. So find your allies that you can work with but all, and, and, and try to change that culture. And it really is amazing. In Sweden, okay, you know, that goes back a long way in Sweden, but in Sweden, the public officials, when they're trained, they know if you get a request from the public, it's like your boss has asked you to do something. And you are supposed, as a Swedish public official, to stop what you're doing and prioritize answering that request. That is just a world apart from the idea that, oh, well, I'm rather busy and I want to go home at five, so I can't really answer that request. So part of your challenge here is changing the culture inside the administration, not just the law. It's about much more than a law. So just a very short, pragmatic question then. I'm going to come to you, to Thomas. Uh, as you're leaving the city of Vienna now, who are the allies yeah. in the city of Vienna? I mean, whom am I going to ask if I want some data on the city level? <laughs> uh, yes. As I mentioned, the next uh, platform meeting will be 29th yeah. of June, I think. Uh, you just can go there and have um, a couple of people sitting on the podium, and you can ask them, and, you know, there's a CIO. Uh, from the technical department and from the statistics department. So you have the people that are open-minded and see that the change inside uh, the administration is necessary as well. And um, you have a lot of people that are uh, your uh, can be your partners in opening up data. Uh, so just go there and ask the questions. And there are also politicians dropping by, and you can even ask uh, Stadträtin or Stadtrat. So it's a good opportunity to be there in public. Uh, the platforms will be recorded. There's a video afterwards. So it's really a, your chance to, to do it in public and, and demand what you want. Okay. Um, Thank you. I mean, Sorry. I mean, the tragedy in Austria is that the Green Party even is not really fighting in that way as they did it in Germany. Okay? Yeah, I had a lot of conversations with the Green Party and even sometimes representatives even didn't know about the subject. But just a brief question to Helen because you spoke about the application phase. Okay? How do you formulate a request on a subject where you don't know exactly that it has ever been dealt with in a ministry? So in most countries you don't have a comprehensive list and a bibliographic information on the millions of documents, on the databases, whatever even at a list of subjects and terminology, whatever. So how to formulate a request on a subject, on a new subject like ACTA, maybe five years ago, which nobody knows that this subject is already being dealt with in the ministry? Um, you, you're, going to have, you're going to have some suspicion that they're working on yeah. ACTA, right? I mean, you, you know, as somebody said, you have an idea. The more you know about how government works, the better, of course. But if you, if you hear something going on and you and you you could always send a kind of um uh, an initial request just to find out um you could even ask perhaps and again maybe i don't know if this would work in austria but you could ask you know um do you hold documents does your ministry hold documents relating to negotiations on um on this particular treaty or whatever now it they should answer that there are very limited exceptions if, if to answer uh, a question, you know, if, you, if you ask the, um, uh, if, if they hold any, um, there, there are certain kinds of questions where governments have a right not to answer, to sort of not confirm or deny. So, you know, do, do, you, do you hold any investigations into Alexander, whatever the alleged um, the alleged Soviet spy or whatever, they might say, well, we refuse to deny answer that question because if they say, yes, we hold information about the alleged spy, then they're admitting that, that perhaps that they're, they've got that. But they're, they're, they're very sort of extreme and limited examples. But in most cases, you could just ask. Ask for a list of documents. Don't ask for the documents themselves. Ask for a list of documents which you hold about this particular issue. 
So there are, there are questions that can get your foot in the door, and then you, then you can decide from there, OK, here's, I've got a list of documents. This looks like the one I'm after, that meeting. At the EU level, although it's far from perfect, at the EU level there is a, a register. The Council and the Commission have registers of documents. So you can look in the registers. Ah, I see a meeting took place there. Hmm, maybe I'll ask the, 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 the minutes of that meeting. You may or may not get it, but you can, you can ask. Okay, thank you. There was a question. Joseph Dyer was waiting there was for quite a long time. Maybe yeah. we can take two or three because there's one gentleman. I want to just mention uh, an initiative from some uh, journalists in Switzerland, um, Öffentlichkeitsgesetz.ch, uh, uh, where they have a little bit like fragt, fragt in Staat.de, um, uh, a uh, portal uh, where you can download uh, forms for to make the request and even you can demand for the journalists to help you to make a, a request for uh, open data. Okay, thank you. And there was a question somewhere over here. Yeah. Mira. Yes. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thanks for that. I've been trying to find that website. I've heard about it, haven't I? Just, just one detail. I may remember wrong from the ranking before you showed us, so then we just skipped this question. But uh, now Sweden has been mentioned yeah. two times, as in, uh, you know what I'm heading I know up what to. the question is, All yes. Right. Why is Sweden so, so far down the ranking yeah. as well? So yeah. Sweden is, is far down the list of the rankings, yes. as is Norway yes, or and other Norway. countries with a yeah. standing record of openness. Yeah. Well, well noted, absolutely. Um, you're absolutely right. The law on paper is not great. And I would not recommend, and what happened, in fact, um, there we are, great. Um, I was involved in a, a group, they invited a group of international experts in 1999 to draft the Bosnian Freedom of Information Act. And we had um, Swedish people involved in that process and they pushed the Swedish model very hard because Sweden's got the best access to information regime in the world. It was a complete disaster for Bosnia. Because, and that's what I mean, it's about more than a law, it's about a culture. The Swedish access to information law doesn't mention a lot of things which you really need to put into a new law in somewhere like Serbia today. It doesn't talk about the formats which you can get the documents in. It does, obviously, you didn't really have much choice in format in 1766. So there are plenty of things which are missing and which um, it, it, you know, it, it have been compensated for by practice, by jurisprudence in some cases, decisions from the ombudsperson in Sweden. Um, and that is the big danger in a rating like this, is that you give the wrong impression, that we give the impression that Liberia has got a, a much better access to information regime than Sweden, which is clearly not the case. Um, but it, it tells us something. It tells us something which is useful for countries that are drafting new laws or reforming the law to try to change a culture. Um, but you do have to be careful with it. One of the big problems that we have as a, a sort of activist community is getting good data on how things are working in practice. Um, now with these different websites, we're beginning to capture some kind of an idea. So we will have, um, we talked about this at the um, Alavatelli conference in, in Oxford earlier, the, the name of the software that's used to write many of these sites, not for Start, but many of the others, is Alavatelli, which is the name of the town where that chap I showed you with the funny tie, um, from 1766, that's the town he was born. So the software's called Alavatelli after him. Um, but we're beginning to capture more data. We've got a big challenge now, and I think it's a very important and interesting question with the open data portals. Um, we've got everyone doing open data portals, but I know in Spain, in Spain, some of the open data portals just have a few PDFs put on them that were already public. So the government's making a lot of noise. Well, we've got this fantastic, in Andalusia, we've got this fantastic new open data portal, but there's no new information in it. So how do we actually evaluate whether the French open data portal has better information on it than the, the British or, or the German one, for example? Um, we, we haven't got those measures yet because that's quite a lot of work to actually evaluate that. So in terms of measuring transparency in practice, there's a lot of work to be done. I think if we did that, then we'd have a much, and combined that with our ranking, we'd have something that was told us a much truer story about what's going on. But it, no, it's a very important question. Have you got something there? Sorry, yeah. can I slightly contradict you? We're starting to okay. do this. Basically, um, of course you are. <laughs> um, the idea is to, to get, a, get an idea of... Um, 
given that there's a few few data sets that we can agree are kind of important, both for business and for transparency, um, are, in, in which countries are which documents available? Um, oh. I don't think this is a great data visualization. I apologize for that part of it. <laughs> um, but basically, I don't know if... Uh, uh, no, Austria is not in here. So who has five minutes here to answer one of these, um, one of these surveys for one of the key um, documents that are in here? So uh, the things we have right now, public transport, zip code databases, statistical data, legislation, spending data, budgets, maps, etc. It's kind of very basic stuff. But in most countries, for example, a company's register, you wouldn't find one. Uh, that's, that's kind of really available, available, available as bulk data. So um, yeah, we're thinking about expanding this by another five or so data sets. But kind of just to get a, get a key, uh, get an idea of whether the key data sets around mm -hmm. this is kind of useful. Yeah, uh, maybe we can maybe we can complete that together. Yeah, no, it would be, be fantastic it, yeah. to, to do that. Um, I mean, I would add other things there. Well, you've got you've got some spending stuff, but I would like data from the health service and the education service. Some more sort of data about not just spending, but about the way those things are functioning, how services are being delivered. There's lots of things we could think to add. But absolutely, this is the thing. If we're talking about um, what did you say, the currency of democracy? What was the quote? Information is the currency of democracy. Um, you know, I, I was actually at a, a conference in, in, in Paris recently and someone from the, um, I think he was, Nicholas, I don't know if you know him, the Mairie du Quatrième or the, the fourth, uh, fourth district of Paris. But he said that the Mairie of Paris has put a database online with 6,000 trees inside the inside Paris on it. And I took a gamble because I thought, well, they put the trees up there, but I said, yeah, but, and I didn't know, and I said, but I bet you haven't done your full, full database of public procurement contracts yet, have you? And he said, no, we haven't. So what's important? Yes, it's good to know about the trees in Paris and the health of each of the 6,000 trees <laughs> inside Paris, I agree, is very important, um, and where they're located. But I would also perhaps like to know something about, for example, how public procurement's going. So I think, I think this is the challenge, and that's great that you've started doing that, so we can hopefully yeah. contribute to that. Last round of questions. Any other question? I have another question, maybe I just missed that, but is there any uh, platform uh, where resources, data resources for Austria in particular are collected? Because you told us about the European Union level. Is this something where you can find, have an overview? Um, yes, uh, you, you mean an Austrian uh, open data portal? Uh, yeah. Has just launched recently and uh, Gregor, who's responsible for it, is sitting in the back there. And so yes, uh, there is an uh, Austrian open data portal just, uh, yeah, brand new. Yeah. So, so it's, a, it's available under data.gov.at. Um, so that's something that, yes, it could be used to fill that in. And then as journalists, you so can write about what's on it and what's not on it and true. perhaps analyze that uh, in terms of what you're getting and what you should be getting. If you want to know about the portal, you have to ask him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just <Yep. laughs> to let you know. Uh, and then I have two other questions. Uh, the first one is to Thomas again. Uh, can you give an example for data that is available, uh, for example, in the city of Vienna? And you have been wondering why no journalists did something with that. Because you said your interest or your involvement, the involvement from media people was low. And so maybe there is an example where you have some data, you made data available and you think, oh, wow, that could make a wonderful story, but nobody did it. Uh, for example, it's a um, lot of population data regarding um, the big issue in Austria and Vienna. Uh, we had it in the uh, panel in the, uh, uh, earlier today um, regarding migration. So there is available data. Really, um, there are two data sets. One, uh, you might think it's a funny data set. It's the most popular um, birth names given to um, Ch children. So if you have uh, that number, 50% of all kids are with a non-German speaking background, as we heard earlier today. So you could have a look at the names that were given to the children, and you can also have a look to not just the numbers for the districts, which, which are quite big uh, units, but the level below. Um, where do the people come from? And is this uh, really what, what, what's your impression, what have you got in mind about which are the problems uh, in, in Vienna, for, in, in which districts, is there a problem with migration? Uh, is, can you really identify that in the numbers? 
Yeah, and very important, you have the numbers not just for uh, today, but also back, you have also historical data. So you can go back and, for example, make some uh, animations, time frames. How is uh, the city changing? Where is the population uh, growing? Where is it shrinking? Um, this is data that I think is very important if you think about reporting on a district uh, level, which, uh, if you, for example, you have a lot of prejudices in about certain districts. The 10th district, for example, has a bad uh, standing in public opinion, or the 15th district. Is that true? Why is it true or is it wrong? You could prove su uh, such um, um, prejudice with, with, with actual data that's available. But you have to do, uh, perhaps uh, use not just one database, but use two databases and connect them. Okay. And that's perhaps the problem that you need uh, some skills for that. And I think uh, this is, uh, hasn't been done yet. And you could also visualize uh, this uh, data, of course, in a map, um, in a very detailed level. So I think um, what also would, I would encourage you to, to go to these platforms where, where we have a lot of people with a technical background that are very capable of creating apps, creating visuals, but they're not, they don't uh, perhaps uh, ask the questions that journalists would ask, and journalists perhaps could ask the questions, but lack uh, certain skills which uh, the other community from the, with a more technical background has got. And so if you bring that together, you can also solve the problem we, we discussed earlier today. Is it capable for smaller uh, media companies to, to uh, be able to do data journalism? There are people with a lot of skills. They're happy if you give them, create an idea together for interesting apps. Uh, also example for, with, with data that's available uh, okay. in the portal. I think this is always, uh, also a very great uh, hint that we don't only have to discuss national data and political journalism and uh, budget, but this is also a very interesting topic on a local and regional level. And then, Joe, I have another question. Uh, oh, sorry, I didn't see that. Thanks for co-moderation. Yeah, yeah. I'm so free and give us some more minutes. I would just have a question regarding um, access to information. We saw before ways to access information. One is obviously also a leak. Now, we had this well, the most known case of WikiLeaks. And there was a, a big debate about how much such a big, um, su such a document dump actually contributes to openness because on the other hand there's so much information that you, that basically it, it obliterates everything else you do, you're just focusing on this and you forget about everything else so what, what's your take on this <laughs> this is a huge question yeah it's a, it's a good question i'll try to answer it briefly um i mean i think that one of the things that you know, in an ideal world, you'd never, you, the exceptions would be applied perfectly and everything else would be available and we wouldn't need leaked information because only real secrets would be that, you know, you need to, very sensitive military codes or something would be kept secret. Um, what, the Liki, what the WikiLeaks um, uh, document dump, as you describe it, revealed was that there's a lot of information which is classified which really doesn't need to be classified for any reason or which is being misclassified because it's being um, classified in order to hide embarrassment, wrongdoing and so forth. So I think it showed us um, that even America, which is famous for its Freedom of Information Act, um, it's not working. I mean, we know that, but this, this really revealed that. Um, and how much information in this, how much international relations, which is a, another area with national security and international relations, I would say, is actually a bigger challenge in terms of access to information than, than national security um, because you know, NATO, NATO advises member states not to overclassify information because they, and precisely what happened with WikiLeaks, NATO tells its member states if you overclassify, then the wrong kind of, inf you're going to have to try to keep secret too much information and something's going to leak out and maybe it will be the wrong information. So, um, but with international relations, a lot of stuff is classified, which really should be in the public domain, which we should know. And the WikiLeaks uh, revealed that, which was useful in terms of the argument. I think it also did a lot of damage um, because it raised this specter and it allowed governments to argue um, that there is, a, there is a problem of total transparency and look how damaging it can be. It caused a number of governments to actually tighten up 
the way in which they um, manage information, which perhaps is good, but at the same time, it, it caused a kind of negative attitude towards transparency, which I think has been dangerous. So there, there are sort of pros and cons to that, and we can talk more about it afterwards in the coffee break if you want, but that's a brief answer to your question. I don't know if anyone else wants to comment on Wiki. Thank you. Anyone on the panel has the urgent need to say something? Because if not, I ask Joe a final question. You want to comment? No. Thomas? Okay, and Joe, a final question. If you would make one FOI request now, what would it be? Um, well, I, um, I think that it's, uh, what we've learned here is uh, as well that uh, the media have to, uh, that there's, have to be a, a change in culture as well. And even the media is uh, challenged to treat information uh, properly actually, so not, not everything you learn, actually, you, you, every figure you get um, out, of, out, of, uh, out of the administration is, is probably a scandal, uh, but at least it's important to know. But the, the only thing, if, if politicians would have to answer honestly, um, um, and I can, could force that, I would just like to know why it's so important for them to keep all of that stuff secret. It would just be the question of the question. And yeah. probably the answer is 42, like in... Yeah, maybe. <laughs> well, my, my question would be whether, um, to the government, when is Austria, um, where, whether and when is Austria going to sign the Council of Europe Convention on Access to Official Documents? Because if you did sign that, it would force you to change your law. So I think that would be a really interesting question to ask. Yeah. Well, I would uh, like to know about the advertising spendings for, from all the government bodies to which media, how much money. So this is uh, due in Austria. It's certainly coming, uh, but I would rather want it now than tomorrow. Krita, you have a question? <laughs> Sorry, I'm unprepared for the Austrian... <laughs> no, but it doesn't have to be an Austrian, doesn't have to be an Austrian question. <laughs> but you mm. don't have to. You're no. doing it all the time. So <laughs> okay. That's some that are often, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so thank you very much. We have a coffee break until four. What awaits you after the coffee break is a talk with Phil Mayer via Skype. Phil Mayer uh, earned a Pulitzer Prize with his team for computer-assisted re reporting in 1969. Wow. <laughs> wow. Have a good break. Thank you very much. Thank you.